We will now, uh, without a break, uh, launch uh, our uh, first panel with Ivarez Abramovichus. Uh, please uh, join me here. Ivarez and Ivan Miklos. I think you probably uh, know both of them, but uh, just in case, uh, I'll uh, reintroduce. Uh, Ivarez Abramovichus is uh, Minister of Economy. He has joined the Ukrainian government uh, and uh, got the Ukrainian passport in December of uh, 2014. A very brave uh, decision on his part that uh, we have been very grateful uh, for him to do, along with uh, other similar ministers uh, who had uh, to make that uh, difficult choice uh, and uh, support Ukraine in one of its most uh, difficult moments. Uh, before joining the government, uh, Ivarez has been a long-term partner of uh, East Capital, a Swedish-based uh, asset management company, one of the largest uh, investing in Central and Eastern Europe and other emerging markets. Uh, including also being one of the largest uh, investors in Ukraine already since the early uh, 2000s. Ivan Miklos uh, uh, is uh, the uh, currently advisor of the ministers of uh, economy and uh, finance uh, in Ukraine for the past uh, a little bit uh, over a year. Uh, until uh, recently he was also deputy of the Slovak Parliament and between 1998 uh, and approximately 2008, so for about 10 years, uh, he's been for most part uh, Minister of Finance of Slovakia and Deputy uh, Prime Minister uh, in charge of uh, reforms. Uh, Slovakia, under his and the Prime Minister Zurinda's leadership, uh, achieved uh, some of the very best uh, results in terms of uh, attraction of FDI. You may know that Slovakia is now the largest producer of cars uh, per capita in the world. Uh, it has uh, launched in 2004 one of the most progressive uh, tax uh, reforms and Mr. Miklos has been voted uh, uh, repeatedly as one of the top reformers in Eastern Europe. Uh, I will uh, first give uh, the word to Ivarez. Uh, uh, he is a person that has been in the media uh, a lot over the last uh, approximately five weeks uh, since he has uh, had a press conference uh, uh, where he announced uh, his resignation uh, because of uh, um, uh, problems in uh, removing vested interests. Uh, uh, if I can express it this way, so I will rest the floor is yours. Yeah. Uh, good morning, everyone, and uh, thank you, Thomas, and uh, thank you, Thomas, uh, obviously, and your colleagues, uh, Peter and Brian, for, for making this event for already 12 years uh, running. I think it's uh, been uh, phenomenal, but over these uh, past years, you continuously attract uh, uh, so many um, investments to, to, to this country, and I wish you all the success that you continue to do for many more uh, years. As Thomas said, on, uh, was it already February 3, I have uh, resigned. Uh, prior to that, I, w I attended more or less all your previous uh, conferences in the capacity of, of one of the larger investors, when last year I was already in the capacity of the minister, and this year I don't exactly know in what capacity I'm uh, here. On uh, February 3, I uh, uh, have resigned uh, uh, right now, obviously pending a uh, vote uh, uh, in Verkhovna Rada, uh, so, uh, which gave me an opportunity to f spend a full uh, two weeks on, on school holiday with kids, which is a rare opportunity. Uh, in any case, um, again, thank you for, for, for bringing in so many people, and I think that uh, Ukraine is an extremely interesting uh, sort of a uh, period of its uh, transformation right now. And as I said many times, we have two steps away from a breakthrough or two steps away from the breakdown. And it is very important what decisions will be made now that will really shape the future uh, of this country in terms of development and, and, and the speed of this development. As Mark Twain, uh, Twain once said, uh, patriotism uh, is supporting your country all the time and your government when it deserves it. Uh, and I believe in this uh, one uh, as well myself. 
Uh, this is why, although I have resigned from the government, I certainly believe uh, in this country very much, and I remain uh, uh, a huge uh, uh, sort of a support in Ukraine, its people, its potential, uh, and, and the future. I have lived here for, for many years. I have lived here for almost eight years. I have invested here a lot of money. Uh, and uh, I have worked uh, hard to reform this country over the last uh, 14 months since I became a minister. And I believe uh, in Ukraine, and I believe that you should believe in Ukraine too. And here are three reasons why investors should keep Ukraine on the uh, radar. So first of all, microeconomic uh, stabilization, uh, macro uh, financial stability has really been achieved. It may sound as an as a easily achievable target, but the type of situation that we found when we came into the government was absolutely appalling. So nevertheless, I'm sure that Minister of Finance will dwell in, 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 in detail about that, but among the major achievements, obviously, is debt restructuring, massive decrease in public expenditures and, and the debt burden as percentage of GDP, unprecedented cleanup of the banking system, falling inflation, fairly stable exchange rate, at least in the last uh, second half of last year. And in the last uh, two quarters of last year, we already had a growth in terms of GDP on a quarter, uh, on quarter basis, and we expect a modest growth uh, uh, this year as well. So I believe it is safe to, uh, really safe uh, to say that Ukraine has survived the worst, and it is on a firm uh, path uh, for recovery. Second, I would like to point uh, that uh, openness and transparency has really become priorities and the buzzwords for the government, for the parliament, for the presidential administration. Ministry of Justice has opened up just about any type of uh, uh, registrar uh, that there is, uh, really giving a lot of public information on all types of properties that public servants own and so on. Government budget and spending is available online as well. Our new public procurement system only in a test mode already saved a billion grivna. And once it comes into full effect, uh, uh, it's going to save 50 billion uh, grivnas a year. And I believe we will have the most modern and the most advanced public procurement system uh, in Europe. Every bit of red tape and every license has been questioned, and we abolished many of those. About 40% of licenses have been abolished, uh, therefore decreasing really opportunities where business and government come together and minimizing those uh, corruption uh, sort of opportunities. Uh, both my work and even my resignation managed uh, to chip uh, into this corruption fight, yet both society and foreign partners accept, expect much uh, more uh, from that. Uh, and I believe that 2016 shall be really a year where much progress shall be uh, more visible after much of 2015 has really been spent on creating those new institutions like National Anti-Corruption Bureau uh, and uh, so on. And third, uh, despite all the efforts, particularly on the Russian side, to derail the process of DCFTA on January 1, uh, this agreement came into force and uh, Ukraine has a real opportunity to become the so-called factory of Europe, whereby we encourage uh, European and uh, other global companies to set up manufacturing facilities in Ukraine with a name to export back to uh, EU. And not many people in the West actually know. But from now on, you can set up manufacturing facilities in Ukraine with lots of advantages, as we know, with low value of its currency, and export back without any tariffs to Europe. In spite of all these uh, difficulties that we have uh, at the moment, Many companies continue to invest. The likes of Cargill, Leone, Fujikura, uh, they have uh, either made new investments or continue to invest on the top of the existing ones. Last year, FDI totaled $3.1 billion uh, in Ukraine, and we had an ambitious target of $5 billion uh, this year, again, despite all of these hardships. Everyone is asking me the same question. When will the situation be more stable so that we can invest safely? I can tell you one thing, the single-minded pursuit of the so-called uh, stability has led Ukraine to the brink of the abyss. Now as Ukraine is trying to shed Soviet and post-Soviet uh, legacy, the name of the game is change. Uh, Ukraine must choose reforms versus uh, stagnation. This is why the political turmoil is not necessarily a bad thing. With each 
uh, iteration, we can get a new chance uh, to for, uh, for reforms, uh, more reformist government that would be focused on bringing about the change and improving the lives of its uh, citizens. However, it is our task to ensure that there is enough pressure on the politicians to work harder on reforms. No matter whose name on the prime minister's office, uh, the government must be accountable to its citizens, uh, to the country's investors and the international uh, community. On February 3, I tried to contribute to this fight, obviously, as well, exposing the facts of political corruption uh, that are incompatible with the reform process. Yet I was glad that my resignation brought uh, the light to the matters that are holding back our reforms. Finally, after several months of delays, uh, for example, after almost 20 attempts of vote in Verkhovna Rada, we managed to push through the privatization bill. Uh, it guarantees that privatization will be transparent and open. Um, I hope that this newly found commitment uh, to the privatization, even from the political parties that ideologically opposed it just a month ago, will result in expanding the list of uh, assets to be privatized beyond uh, the current list of about 450 companies that are expected to be sold this year, including about 20 from the list that are reasonably large. Uh, and I really urge you to look at uh, this list and continue monitoring the list because there might be some interesting assets uh, to look at. And uh, uh, the litmus test uh, of our intentions uh, for transparent and professional privatization will be Odessa Seaside Port Privatization, which is expected uh, to conclude sometime later this uh, summer. We also managed uh, during the same week to finally adopt uh, a very much needed law on corporate governance uh, standards uh, in the state-owned uh, enterprises, which really uh, obliges uh, those companies to undergo international uh, audit, uh, which allows and forces uh, state-owned companies to form uh, supervisory boards, which was not the case before so far, and establishes an institution of independent directors. By the end of March, by the end basically of this month, uh, the newly founded uh, Supervisory uh, Council of Naftogaz will be formed, which is going to be a huge uh, sort of a, uh, again, litmus test for how further this reform with corporate governance can go. Three out of five members of the board will be independent. And we have hired the best world-known um, recruiting company from London to find those three really suitable candidates uh, to fill uh, uh, the board. Overall, the progress in terms of bringing more transparency, more accountability, and simply more publicity to state-owned enterprises is already bearing fruit. If in 2014, losses of state-owned companies were 116 billion grivna, then last year, losses were by 100 billion grivna uh, less. So huge savings, predominantly based on the naftogaz gas of Ukraine going from red, uh, basically, into, into the black. We have made progress towards deregulation and making Ukraine a better place uh, in terms of doing business. Not enough yet, but we have created the largest reform office of all based on uh, EU uh, financing, which is called Better Regulation Delivery Office, with up to 70 people eventually working day and night on deregulation. They have uh, basically uh, developed a roadmap where within two years we can get into top 20 in terms of doing business. Right now we are number 83, I believe. Uh, it takes 43 steps for those two years, and already this year we could get into top 50 if Verkhovna Rada passes 23 very important steps uh, when it comes to deregulation. The conference is taking place at a time when there are more questions than answers. What will government look like uh, in a month? Uh, is it gonna be truly democratic? Uh, obviously democratic, truly technocratic uh, uh, or special interests uh, will uh, prevail, uh, who will be the prime minister, who will be you know, the first uh, deputy prime minister, uh, will Verkhovna Rada pass the laws that cabinet of ministers will be proposing from here on and so on. Whatever happens now, I assure you that Ukraine is committed to move uh, towards, uh, towards Europe and the world. Ukrainians have made their choice. 
The political elites may lag behind in some areas, uh, but during my time within the government, I have met enough of bright, uh, courageous and reform-minded people, both in the civil service and the civil society, who will make sure that Ukraine realizes its full potential. So with this, uh, I just want you to uh, uh, enjoy Kiev in this warm uh, spring uh, day, and uh, I am sure that, again, the worst is already firmly behind us, and let's focus on the positive uh, future. Thank you very much. Th thank you, Ivris. I have uh, one, one question, and then I'll pass uh, the floor to Ivan. Uh, you have been uh, one of the first people that has, so to say, tested the, the work of the National Anti-Corruption Bureau. You have uh, visited that uh, institution uh, several times uh, over the last months. Uh, what is your impression? Is it uh, truly independent? And uh, uh, does it raise uh, hopes uh, that these new institutions, among them the ones that were created over the last year and a half legislatively and uh, started working physically uh, well, over the last few months, maximum a year, uh, how, how would you evaluate them? Well, first of all, uh, Ministry of Economic uh, Development and Trade uh, has uh, contributed nicely to the work of National Anti-Corruption Bureau because we gave them our building. Uh, we have reduced uh, staff by 50%, so therefore we've made a lot of buildings vacant, including the one where they sit now. So I have uh, had a pleasure of four times, uh, you know, uh, going there. Uh, I think, you know, well, I, I, I accused uh, uh, certain uh, sort of a... Uh, individuals of uh, political corruption, basically meddling into the ministry's work. I think this is completely incompatible with the reform process, where, you know, certain personalities, you know, by brutal almost force uh, are forced upon you, and they have nothing to do with the type of HR policy that I was uh, advocating for. Uh, when it, but I think that uh, my case will certainly lead uh, to some more cases within uh, uh, sort of a, the area of fraud in uh, state-owned enterprises. And I think there are some uh, people, you know, and I'm not a prosecutor, I'm not an investigator, I'm not an investigative journalist, uh, you know, per se and so on, but a lot of stuff has been really very well documented, as we know, by Sergei Leshenko and by, by others. So I am certain that, uh, you know, that you know, more transparency and more openness and the institutions that have been set up now will lead uh, to some concrete results that society and investors will appreciate. I think it's about time for that. Mm -hmm. uh, there was yesterday one news that uh, one of the people uh, that have been recommended to you as uh, Deputy Minister, Mr. Pasichnik, uh, left uh, on holiday for three weeks, uh, uh, just two hours, informing uh, the National Anti-Corruption Bureau, just two hours uh, before he was supposed to uh, show up there for his first uh, interrogation. So uh, perhaps you have hit uh, uh, the, right, uh, uh, the right targets. Uh, Ivan, uh, could you please uh, you, uh, give your assessment? You have been one of the first uh, uh, foreigners to come to Ukraine after the Euromaidan revolution. Uh, you have already in March uh, 2014, you came here with a group of uh, Central and East European reformers uh, to provide your advice so that Ukraine does not reinvent the wheel and just follows the uh, best uh, reforms that were already implemented. Uh, how has Ukraine done over the last two years that you have been coming here on a monthly basis and spending a lot of time? Thank you. Thank you, Tomasz. Uh, thank you for inviting me. This pleasure and honor for me to, to be here again. Uh, when, I, when I was here, at the same place one, one year ago, I said that reforms are much more political than economic problem. That from the economic or technical point of view, we know what to do, we know what works, we, we know what doesn't work. Which means if we are speaking about what kind of economic model we are creating, what uh, Mr. Groisman was uh, mentioning here, I think it is clear. It is, I mean, it is clear not only because experiences from other countries, but also because I participated on Ivora's document, to, uh, The Way to Prosperity, which is a very short document based on this, on what kind of principles economic, economic reforms and economic model has to be built if Ukraine wants to be successful. 
because this is really clear. This is clear from point of view of experiences from other transition countries. The most successful countries are, are Baltic countries, uh, Poland and Slovakia, and the common denominator of their reforms is that they did quick, complex and comprehensive reforms based on economic freedom, on uh, liberalization, deregulation, privatization, on, uh, of course, structural reforms, on macroeconomic stabilization, which uh, also Ivar has, has, has mentioned. And it is clear that if country is doing this kind of reforms, then progress is quicker. It is possible to see on, on figures. This is un undisputed. Uh, what, of course, is the problem or is the question how this, what was achieved during this one year? On one side, I have to say that I agree and even I would like to stress even more than during the last two years, especially during the last one year, it was done much, much, much more than 20 plus years before. But at the same time, it is possible to say that it was not it was done not enough. I mean, not enough from the point of view of the necessity for the change, but also possibility of the change. Saying by other words, it was possible to do, to do more. Now, the biggest problem and the most important problem is that we can say maybe that despite that it was done really, really, really a lot, and it was mentioned by you, Thomas, it was mentioned by Evras, it was mentioned by uh, Mr. Speaker, what, what was achieved, it was still not achieved tipping point, which means still it was not achieved critical minimum amount of change for saying that it was done, that this time is different and now we just need to, 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 to continue. This is also a reason why today's situation is really important. And it's really important how Ukraine will move from this place and from, from this moment. Which means from technical point of view, from the content, it is not only clear, but there is also a lot of very good, very positive pro-reform proposals, mainly prepared by the government, but also by a lot of NGOs who are really very, very active here, who are playing a decisive role in, in Ukrainian society. But let's speak about this political side, because as I said, political dimension is much, much more important. What I can say after my experience during last year, here, last two years, but mainly one year, I'm more, more frequently here, that it was proved. I mean, this definition that reforms are much, much more political problem than economic problem or technical problem was proved in, in Ukraine. Usually I'm I'm saying that the most important precondition, political precondition for successful reform, reforms is strong enough leadership, ownership of reforms, and communication of reforms. And this is the problem, but this is the problem in every country, not only in the countries, uh, post-communist countries with, with very difficult legacy. And as Ivar has correctly said, Ukraine has not only post-Soviet, but also, also uh, post, post, uh, post only Soviet, but also post Soviet. Tak. Not only Soviet, but also post Soviet uh, difficult, difficult legacy is that in every country people are afraid from change, changes. People, people feel fears from changes. And people, in reality, even if they, in general and in principle, support changes, then if you, if you are going, if politicians are going in the, in the specific concrete steps, then it is natural, natural aversion to, do, uh, to, to, to change. And it was the case also in Slovakia, I have to say, in every country. Let me, let me because Slovakia in 98, after Mečiar era, was in similar situation like Ukraine is now. Unrestructured economy, lagging behind, no FDIs, uh, huge corruption, isolation from the EU, and so on and so on. And then we did really this kind of radical, comprehensive, and complex reforms. It was because now everybody is, will agree, maybe, that the main reason of the political crisis now in Ukraine is the confidence crisis, is the lack of trust among people, among society, among politicians, inside of coalition, and so on and so on. 
But that's the reason why leadership, ownership, and communication is such an important. In Slovakia, when we did these reforms, which really speeded up economic development, and which, 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 by, by, by them we 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 achieved this this success, being the, one of the most successful reform country from the position of lagging behind of, of everybody. At that time, distrust of the society with our reforms was huge. At that time, it was public opinion polls, and they asked. What do you think about this kind of policy, this, all these deep, comprehensive, radical reforms? Among economic analysts, 90% of them answered, yes, we agree, it's good. Among general public, 90%, 9-0, answered, we don't trust, it is wrong, we are afraid, we feel fears from this. But in these conditions, of course, this is natural situation. It is necessary to have strong leadership, strong ownership of reforms and communication of reforms. Situation here is very similar, it is natural. By one public opinion polls, after Maidan, people answered, the question was, what are reforms? What do you mean reforms are? 40% of people answered here in Ukraine after Maidan, increasing salaries and, and pensions. 20% answered denationalization de uh, of, the, of the oligarchs uh, property. Of course, that this is dissatisfaction today if this kind of unrealistic expectation, it is necessary to say, were at that time. But the same unrealistic expectations were after, after a Velvet Revolution in Czechoslovakia, after, after collapse of, of, of communism in, in Poland. Which means, but very important is to explain people that today's hardship is not because reforms. It's because, and not only because war with Russia and trade war, but also because legacy of the Soviet and post-Soviet times, legacy of the 70 years of communism, and then 20 plus years of the oligarchic non-reform system, which means it is, like, it, is, it is not because reforms, it is because of lack of reforms. But if there is no sufficient communication of this, if there is not strong enough leadership, I mean by leadership, strong vision, will, and courage to do reforms despite of political risk and poli political, political cost of the, of the reforms. Ownership. Or one more il illustration, because corruption is, is a very good example also in this regard. It is general acceptance and agreement that corruption is one of the, the biggest obstacles for, for successful development, and it is general support for fighting against corruption. But what is important, that it has to be strong leadership, ownership, and communication to explain people that, for instance, energy tariffs deregulation is one of the most effective methods on the fighting against corruption. That liberalization, privatization, and deregulation is one of the most effective methods how to fight against corruption. Because if not, then you have today's situation. That among, by Vox Ukraine, when they did this assessment of the, of the reforms, the best, the number one among all reforms from the, from the importance and efficiency was ranked energy price deregulation. Not only because fighting against corruption, also because increasing energy efficiency, increasing uh, energy uh, uh, in independency, and so on, so on, many, many reasons. But if this is not communicated enough, then of course there is a big difference between perception of the experts and perception of the people. And then if there is no trust among people, then it is increasing nervosity and no trust in, uh, between, between co in coalition and so on, so on. Which means what I think is the, a yeah, few words about, about, about ownership and communication. The most important reforms were done, and in many areas, changes and reforms were done. But maybe the most important reforms have been done not mainly because strong enough ownership by Ukrainian politicians, but because pressure, effective pressure from outside, from the IMF, from the EU, from, from, from financial markets. Uh, Tariffs deregulation is, is one example. Or 
because the, the, the help from outside, Georgian reformers in, in patrol police, police reform, which is great, which is good, but if there is not sufficient and strong enough ownership, if politicians are not convinced that reforms are good, not good not because somebody are necessary, not because somebody from outside is, is pushing for reforms, but because they are convinced that it is only way and only method how to improve the, the life of the Ukrainians, then of course we have, we have still a problem. Because the most successful transition countries did not only what IMF and other donors asked them, they did more reforms than it was necessary by the, by the IMF program, for instance. And communication is again, again the, same, the same problem. Which means, uh, I see the biggest problem in, uh, in here, in the lack of, or lack, insufficient level of leadership, ownership, and communication of reforms. And then it is reflecting in the relations of the government and parliament. Because I'm not speaking about this to blame anybody, government or parliament, but situation when around, just around one third of government legislation proposals were passed in Rada is abnormal. This is one of the biggest obstacles for insufficient progress or not such good as it could be possible in the reform process. And now let me conclude by speaking about the current situation from this point of view, because it, it is important to, to look at this from this, from this point of view. If, uh, as, as I said, Ukraine is in the, in the critical period because we are not behind the, 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 the tipping point. Uh, the key will be the rest of this year. And solution, we can call it technocratic government, we can call it result-oriented government, like, like Mr. Speaker has mentioned, doesn't matter. But the important is that it has to be created after reshuffling of this government or, or, or change of this government. It has to be created a new kind of agreement, at least, I don't know for how long, but at least for long enough period to overcome this critical period and to achieve this tipping point and to do critical minimum amount of reforms and changes to not be in this dangerous area. As Tomasz has mentioned also, to not repeat last year, February events and, 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 and circumstances. A very important, in my opinion, in this regard will be to uh, have clear Firstly, agreement on the relations between government and parliament based on the content of most important necessary reforms and changes. In my opinion, the most important will be, firstly, of course, uh, unconditional implementation of the IMF program uh, requirements, association agreement and uh, DC, uh, DCFTA, uh, then, of course, uh, visa-free regime requirements. Then privatization, Ivaraz has mentioned this. Privatization is, especially, I'm speaking about privatization of the big, important, or if you want, so-called strategic companies. These companies are one of the biggest source of corruption. And despite of the, it can be partially improved by, by, by corporate governance rules, by hiring, uh, new ma management, but only a real solution, long-term solution, also from point of view of fighting against corruption, improving business environment, but also attracting foreign direct investment is privatization. But privatization of these kind of companies have to be done by normal standard transparent methods, which means international tenders, and it takes almost two years, one and a half, two years, which means it is necessary to start immediately. Immediately now, if we want to have uh, visible results. Then, of course, very important is also uh, reform in, and by the way, all these priorities have been mentioned in the document, The Way to Prosperity, uh, and this document was, uh, I think, uh, prepared in July, July of the, of, of, of the last year. Which means another very important area is public service uh, uh, reform including introduction of the normal wages uh, for the civil, civil servants. 
And then, as it was mentioned, and is mentioning by, by everybody, judicial reform and, and, and prose prosecutor reforms. Then, of course, continuity in the regulation and zero tolerance uh, in corruption, especially between the, the different levels of, of, of power, as I think is not necessary to explain in details, Ivaras' uh, uh, case is an example of, of, uh, of this. Which means, let me, let me conclude that uh, I'm optimist. I'm optimist because I see really, really big, uh, uh, big change. And what I see also is very strong demand. But what is necessary to do is to bridge this demand on the general level, because in general, almost everybody agrees with the necessity of reforms and fighting against corruption and so on, so on, so on, to bridge this support in principle to support for more specific, more concrete measures, reforms, and so on, so on, so on, so on. And for this, it will be, it will be very important how today's political crisis uh, will, be, will be solved. Because on one side, I agree that in general, sometimes maybe it is artificial fear from, from new elections, because yes, we have examples from other countries which were successful and they changed the government very frequently. And during that time, they, they did uh, reforms. But on the other side, we know that if new reforms will be called now, it will mean to break and, and no, uh, at, least, at least half a year, maybe even, even, even longer break. And I'm afraid if today's situation is allowing this kind of comfort. Thank you. Thank you very much, Ivan. Uh... I'll start with questions, and if you have any, please feel free to raise your hand, and you will get a microphone and can ask our speakers. Uh, I mean, Ivaris, you have made a large impact on the investment climate uh, in Ukraine as a minister, uh, but some say that uh, you have made even a larger impact, uh, that your resignation has had even a larger impact uh, on the wider environment here in Ukraine. Could we perhaps... Uh, I mean, you have put forward some conditions uh, when you resigned, uh, like the firing of the prosecutor general, technocratic government led by, uh, for instance, Natalia Yaresko, uh, some other conditions. Uh, we know relatively well about uh, your achievements and the achievements of your ministry. Uh, prior to that, uh, what, has your, uh, what has your resignation caused? What have been the achievements of those last five weeks? Yeah, thank you very much. I, I, indeed, it was a cold shower or whatever you call it, or a reality check uh, uh, for the many politicians, hopefully, in uh, this country. And so we expect a similar type of effect from an absolutely uh, unique and phenomenal uh, Biden speech uh, in the parliament. But it uh, seems like, you know, for one day people were just shocked and uh, walking around uh, thinking, you know, how to do only the right thing. But you know, in the morning of the next day, all was uh, forgotten and so on. So I, I was really afraid that, you know, uh, you know, the type of uh, resonance that uh, my um, resignation has caused, that eventually it would still be this, more of the same. So to be raising the carpet, shoving everything under the carpet and kind of moving on as nothing has happened. But uh, in fact, I could at least uh, mention uh, eight things, uh, good things that have happened about my resignation. Maybe some more people should resign if, if this leads to some uh, positive uh, results. So first of all, chances for technocratic government at the time of my resignation were absolutely minuscule. I mean, we, we more or less understood what type of people were aiming uh, to be in the government. And me, as a former investor, and someone who really uh, sort of roots uh, for Ukraine, I didn't want those type of people to, to, to be in the government. So chances for more technocratic government have increased uh, sort of tremendously, and hopefully under the leadership of uh, Natalia Yeresko. Uh, second, privatization, as, 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 as we said it. You know, some parties like Radical Party was, was totally against it. And now they say, if things are so bad at state-owned uh, enterprises, maybe it's going to take, you know, several decades to really uh, reformat those uh, 1,824 uh, state-owned enterprises. Maybe, indeed, let's sell them ASAP. And therefore, first reading on the privatization bill from the 16th attempt, and then second uh, reading from the first attempt a week after my resignation. So that's, that's good. State-owned enterprise, 
you know, I have created a nomination committee uh, to appoint top 60 CEOs. And, you know, still at the ministerial level, there was a lot of uh, sort of a political uh, pressure to um, appoint certain guys so that they end up in the nomination committee and then we have no one to choose from. Um, I think now uh, every person approved uh, as a CEO of state-owned enterprise for the top ones is going to be scrutinized beyond recognition from a publicity point of view. So less chances for the wrong type of people ending there. I mentioned NAFTA gas reform. Really, I believe that the NAFTA gas corporate governance reform is going to be derailed last minute. Just something would happen on the way. And now chances for derailing this, uh, as we in the final stages uh, have become very uh, low. Fifth uh, is public servant uh, salaries. Uh, the moment we became ministers, we were promised that within six months there's going to be a transparent salary top-up fund or whatever you call it from European money, from Ukrainian money, whatever. Because right now, minister salary is like $150. I mean, you're not going to get far with this. I mean, I'm lucky that I live in the center, so I don't need to, you know... Uh, so they spend a lot of money for the, for the gasoline, but the Minister of uh, Agriculture lives out of town and uh, $150 <laughs> is not enough to even fill the tank. So uh, corruption is cemented at the very beginning when you pay inadequate uh, money to the public uh, servants. And now um, I know there was a meeting with G7 ambassadors where Prime Minister said, you know, you promised us some additional money for the public servant uh, salaries and I, and I know that Americans are joining this. And I think overall Ukrainian business should contribute to that and I know Thomas has raised this a number of times and, and, and certainly agrees with that. So I think that the public servant sort of a compensation, fair compensation is, 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 is also going to be solved fairly soon. Six. One of the biggest things that is obstructing reforms, and not many of you would know, and not many people speak about it, is, is the Secretariat of Cabinet of Ministers. It's a Ministry of Cabinet of Ministers which has grown in numbers to almost larger than Ministry of Economy. So we decreased by 50%, they have increased. They have almost you know, six or 700 people. And you know, normal, uh, and, and, and this endless sort of a circulation of documents for months and months and months, and then you know, a ping pong game when it is submitted to the agenda of cabinet of ministers or not. So I also propose to, to, to just close it down. And in, in, in one of the sessions, uh, prime minister suggested getting them to 100 people, which is a huge progress. Some sort of a code of ethics uh, needed, not the one where you cannot criticize the government, but I think something was already signed, uh, basically really outlining the uh, sort of the areas of responsibility between the administration of the president, Verkhovna Rada, and, uh, and uh, ourselves in, in the cabinet of ministers, because all these lines have been completely blurred. Any type of member of the parliament comes into your ministry, he has access to even closed uh, sessions, closed uh, working groups, and so on, and sits there, obviously suggests his own people for a variety of positions, and so on. And you mentioned the uh, prosecutor general. I mean, uh, I did maybe just the last bit, I mean, because everybody in this room and, and beyond this room and abroad and at home wanted this person to, 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 to leave, and it uh, seems like he's on the way out. But unfortunately, it's not really about names, it's about institutions. So it's very important to build strong institutions that we do not you know, protect uh, uh, you know, some personalities and want others uh, out, uh, but that we expect to build strong institutions that, that uh, do the right uh, thing. Thank you. So it seems that uh, some of the conditions that you put forward are uh, on the way to be solved. Uh, would you be ready to rejoin the government uh, uh, at some point in the future? Uh, look, I, I think this is a very uh, exciting job that I had, and I, I did not have a single member of my team. And, you know, I fired about 700 people overall, and uh, we have hired uh, about 250 uh, new people uh, in the ministry in a variety of uh, project groups from Prozora that Max is uh, leading to state-owned enterprises to uh, export promotion to a variety of others. So, and I have not met a single person that did not like what he was doing. So I'm uh, extremely pleased to work with uh, this type of people, also with uh, some individual uh, ministers that are reform-minded. I think uh, there's so much uh, that is left uh, not done yet. So obviously it would be a huge uh, excitement to, to continue that, but uh, I think unfortunately I have bur burned uh, some bridges and it might be uh, very difficult uh, uh, to, to, to come back. Uh, but let's see, miracles do happen. And, uh, <laughs> <laughs> okay. Any questions from me?
VR. Um, I was just wondering if um, you think that the current leadership of the government would be prepared to accept um, you know, the government of independent uh, technocratic ministers in exchange for keeping his job, and do you think that this would be a kind of a feasible working construct and acceptable compromise uh, with a view to reduce the risk of early parliamentary elections? You mean that uh, the prime minister stays, uh, but the rest of the government uh, is technocratic, yeah? Mm -hmm. I mean, is it, is, it, is it possible and uh, you know, do you think that would work and do you think that uh, you know, this is a better outcome than kind of changing the government completely but at the same time risk the early parliamentary elections? As I said uh, already a number of, uh, of times, I think this is really a, a crisis of trust and a crisis of values. I mean, uh, uh, it is, uh, even though uh, Western partners support very much, Prime Minister personally and, uh, and, and the government uh, all together because they see the scenario of unpredictability of the result of the early elections and you know the, the, the revanchist uh, possibility of the opposition bloc, of the populist parties and so on. But I think uh, this is what not society is, is accepting. I mean, society is, is really uh, showing a red card, so to say, to the Prime Minister, uh, for good uh, or for bad. So in order to regain the momentum and buy some more time to do reforms, I personally believed that you need to, to change the Prime Minister and keep majority of the ministers that are technocratic, reform-minded, uh, uh, and so on. But since it is a crisis of uh, values, I thought that you should really appoint a person with completely untainted reputation. And obviously, Natalie Yeresko fits that type of characteristics. Any other questions? There's one more, and then we'll break for coffee break. Yeah, Roman Solzhek, head of uh, the board of directors of the depository. Ivan uh, Ivaris, I think you're uh, you're some of the most progressive uh, people in and around the government. And uh, this is a question more to you, Ivan. Um, do you think you, as uh, you know, the band of international advisors, should be a little more radical in terms of pushing Ukraine towards economic freedom? Because I feel you and the IMF took this sort of conservative middle road, saying, "Well, you know, we shouldn't change too fast," and then it resulted in Ukrainians doing nothing. Right, because your speech you gave, you could have given the same speech in 2015 th at the same time about optimism, about things that need to be changed. The speech you know, pretty much hasn't changed because the country hasn't changed. Actually, it's gotten a little worse. So what I'm saying, maybe you should go the way of Laffer and say complete economic freedom, complete free movement of capital, free convertibility of Grivna, uh, you know, free, um, you know, lower taxes. You know, I know you advocated for Ureska's model of not changing taxes. I mean, do you think it's time basically to radicalize a little bit? No, no, uh, make no mistake about it. I mean, I'm all for uh, radicalization and, uh, you know, simplicity and uh, so on, you know, uh, quick uh, sort of a uh, uh, possibility uh, for a free market for the agricultural land uh, of all these 32 million hectares. I mean, this is the biggest, basically, opportunity to get some investment and uh, so on. But there are some obvious limitations, unfortunately. So I was advocating some other people were uh, just, you know, bringing in some cold shower and reality check and so on. Uh, because uh, macroeconomic stabilization was a key priority and for the right uh, reasons and so on. As, as business people, we understand that we rather have a stable exchange rate than, you know, changing it on a 10% basis uh, every single uh, day. So that has been achieved and step two would have been and continues to be a really a gradual removal of all of these restrictions. And we said prematurely that from January 1, we removed temporary input uh, surcharge, and we did it, 5 and 10 percent, right? Even though it was about to expire only in, at the end of February. Next step, obviously, is all the currency and uh, capital control restriction, because it's difficult to get uh, in uh, FDI in big amounts if, if those uh, things stay in place. Every time you go abroad, you speak about attracting investment. First thing that they ask, because you know their boards will ask, are there any capital restrictions? Can you take the dividends out of the country? And you say, Sorry, not yet, but maybe sort of in, in one year's time. And when the discussion stops, why don't you see me in, uh, in a year's time? And we discuss the opportunity again, so to say. So I, um, I'm, I'm totally uh, uh, for it. And uh, it's just uh, due to some uh, lack. Of, it, it, it's like, you know, you see, 
the, the biggest problem, as Ivan said, is, is, is political leadership of the reforms. This is where the obstruction happens. You have here top politicians who say, we don't understand what type of uh, policies uh, you know, Ministry of Economy is advocating. It's like, come on. I mean, uh, me, uh, uh, Ivan, uh, Olena drafted these uh, principles of economic uh, strategy, which is all based on pretty much uh, liberal uh, uh, way of thinking, level playing field, uh, you know, no corruption, uh, respect for the property rights and so on. And for some people look at it and they say, где точки роста? Right? Uh, <laughs> it's, it's completely crazy. I say, где точки роста? First, return VAT in full and on time, and everybody's going to be happy, and this is going to be your first uh, big reforms. I can't understand how in 2016 there are still bribes to be paid on VAT refunds. It, it, it's, it's ridiculous. We must be the only country in the world uh, that is discouraging exports but, uh, by not uh, refunding uh, VAT in full and on time. And I think uh, this uh, has been really a key priority set uh, for the Minister of Finance uh, for the first half of this year. And I really wish uh, that uh, you know, this uh, particular target is fulfilled. Thank you. Well, let Ivan. me thank yeah. Ah, uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Ivan. Also, yeah, thank you for this question, because it allowed me to explain. A radical approach doesn't mean irresponsible approach. And let me explain on the example of the tax reform, not only here in Ukraine, but also in Slovakia. If you want just bri yeah. briefly, please. Okay, very briefly. Mm -hmm. Thank you. When I prepared a tax reform in Slovakia, IMF didn't agree. I received, uh, it was a mission of, of IMF, and they said, don't do it, it is too radical. But, I have to say, my reform was fiscally neutral in the first year which means it is really necessary to recognize this, 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 this difference. The proposal of so-called radical and liberal alternative tax reform here was not fiscally neutral, was fiscally risky. It was a real danger that it will destroy this very, still very fragile macroeconomic stability and fiscal stability here, the first. Second, my reform and also the reform of the uh, Minister Jaresko was level playing field reform with uh, cancelling the biggest distortions in the system like simplified taxation, Prochena system. Alternative system was not changing this huge distortion and other distortion, which means it is necessary to recognize difference between radical, complex, comprehensive and irresponsible reforms. Let me thank both of our speakers on this. We ran a little bit uh, out of uh, time. And uh, wish them good luck and a lot of energy in contributing to uh, the development of Ukraine. And